स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया This is a problem session in which we will deal with some problems based on the material we saw in the last week. We'll begin by considering a key result which we have used multiple times, which was given to you as an exercise. The problem is about proving that the arc length of the concatenation of two curves is the sum of the arc lengths. Let me write, write down the problem and uh, then let's prove it. So the problem one is the following. Let gamma 1 be a curve from the interval a, b and gamma 2 be a curve from c, d into c be such that the terminal point of gamma 1, that means gamma 1 of b, this is equal to the initial point of uh, gamma 2 means gamma 1 of b is equal to gamma 2 of c and hence we can talk about concatenation of gamma 1 and gamma 2. Then the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2, the concatenation of gamma 1 and gamma 2, that is the sum of the arc length of gamma 1 and the arc length of gamma 2. Let us give a con concrete proof of this statement. The first observation is that if you look at a continuous reparameterization of a given curve, then the reparameterized curve also will have the same arc length. This was given to you as an exercise. I will request you to sit down and give a proof of it if you have not already given one. Assuming this particular exercise, we may assume without loss of generality that b is equal to c. That means the end point of the interval a, b and the initial point of the interval c, d are the same. We can assume without loss of generality by doing a translation of the interval c, d to the interval b, comma e where e will turn out to be a d minus uh, c plus b something like that. We can get hold of the right reparameterization where the interval starts from the point b. So, we will assume without loss of generality that b is equal to c and by the observation that reparameterization does not change the arc length of our given curve, we will still be proving this, this result for good. We will assume that b is equal to c and uh, we will show that the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 and the sum of the arc length of gamma 1 and the arc length of gamma 2, they are arbitrarily close. That will be the strategy of the proof. So, let epsilon positive be given. and we partition the interval a comma d which is now the domain of definition of gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Remember that b is assumed to be equal to c. Let epsilon positive be given and let p given by a equal to t0 less than t1 less than all the way up to say tk which is equal to c which is the same as b. This is less than t k plus 1 less than all the way up to t n equal to b. Let this be a partition, let p be a partition of a comma d which remember is the union of a comma b union b comma d which respectively is the domain of definition of gamma 1 and gamma 2. We have partition of this interval such that let us now use the definition of the arc length of a curve. The arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 which is the supremum over all numbers of the type which I am writing down here. Gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of Tj, the absolute value of this, minus gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of Tj minus 1, where j is going from 1 all the way up to n. So, this is precisely what we have to consider to get hold of the arc length of a given curve. We look at the supremum of such numbers over all partitions. 
and uh, let's pick one such partition which satisfies this condition which that gamma 1 plus gamma 2 arc length is at uh, a distance of less than epsilon by 3. Not just that, we can do more, we can demand that this satisfies this condition as well. Let me put and such that the arc length of gamma 1 minus gamma 1 of tj minus gamma 1 of tj minus 1. Now, let me be a bit uh, careful with the indices. This is going to go from 1 to k. Remember that gamma 1 is defined on the interval a, b. And uh, you look at the partition here, which I am now underlining up till k, tk, this is going to be a partition of a, b. Right. So, this is again less than epsilon by 3. We are not done and such that the party uh, the arc length of gamma 2 is also similarly at a distance of we will worry about the indices after we write it down gamma 2 of tj minus 1 where this j now goes from k plus 1 to n and this is again less than epsilon by 2 epsilon by 3. Uh, what is the first question that we will be asking here? Can we have one such partition at all? The answer is yes, because uh, there can be a partition which satisfies this condition of a b of a d, there can be a partition of this uh, which satisfies this condition of a b, there, there will be a partition of uh, b comma d which satisfies the third condition. Uh, we go down to a common refinement. Now, notice that the partition of a, b and b, d together will give you a partition of a, d. And by going down to the common refinement of the two partitions of a, d, we will be able to ensure that these conditions, all these conditions are satisfied. So, this is something which we can certainly ensure. And once we do that, we are in good shape because then let us look at the absolute value of the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 minus the arc length of gamma 1 plus the arc length of gamma 2 so that there is no confusion. So, this is less than or equal to the absolute value of the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 minus summation uh, j is equal to 1 to n gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj minus gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj minus 1. Remember that whenever I write gamma 1 plus gamma 2 here, it is still a curve. Even though it is there is the plus notation, the, the concatenation is the exact same way we have defined it during the lectures. And the second term will be, I will just rearrange the terms and write it this way. The arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 minus summation j is equal to 1 to n gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj minus gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj minus 1. The first term we have already ensured this which I am now writing in green this is strictly less than epsilon by 3 that is something by choice we already have by the choice of the partition and the second term so this is going to be less than epsilon by 3 plus let us worry about the second term. I will do a further triangle inequality here and write it in this manner. j is equal to 1 to k. What is gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj when j is less than or equal to k? That is going to be equal to gamma 1 of tj by the definition of the concatenation. So, let me write that down. This is basically the same as gamma 1 plus gamma 2 of tj when j is going from 1 to k minus gamma 1 of tj minus 1 and the second term would be let us see where j is now going from k plus 1 to n. I am just splitting that sum from j equal to 1 to n to j equal to 1 to k and j equal to k plus 1 to n and this is just uh, gamma 2 of tj minus gamma 2 of tj minus 1 by the very definition of concatenation. So, we are able to split the, the term which I am now underlining in green as this less than or equal to this plus this by the triangle inequality. 
Right. Now, how did we pick the partition P? We picked it in such a manner that the uh, arc length of gamma 1 is epsilon, epsilon by 3 close to uh, this sum. So, this is again less than epsilon by 3 plus epsilon by 3 and similarly, the arc length of gamma 2 is also less than epsilon by 3 distance from uh, the sum written there and we get that this is entirely less than equal to less than rather uh, epsilon. So, what we have established is that the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 and the arc length of gamma 1 plus arc length of gamma 2 they are epsilon close for every epsilon positive. Since epsilon positive chosen epsilon that was chosen was arbitrary we have the arc length of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is equal to the arc length of gamma 1 plus the arc length of gamma 2 and that is all the result. As a continuation, let us now do one more result about arc length, about uh, continuity property of the arc length. We already have seen that the arc length is a uh, uh, monotonically increasing uh, number, it may not be strictly increasing, but it is certainly not decreasing. This uh, problem tells us that the arc length is actually a continuous function. Let me make it precise. Let gamma from a b into c be a curve. So, remember that a curve means a continuous map from a b into c. Then define the l function l which is representative of the length arc length rather from a b into r be given by then define L to be L of t is equal to defined to be the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t. Then the problem tells us that L is a continuous function and L is a continuous function. We will show that L is left continuous and uh, if we show left continuity that is enough because then we can consider minus of gamma and the left continuity of the length function corresponding to minus of gamma will give us the right continuity of the function L corresponding to gamma. So, uh, I will just write that down given T in AB. We shall prove that gamma is left continuous, not gamma, L is left continuous. Gamma is already continuous. This is enough since right continuity follows. by considering the length corresponding to minus of gamma, the reversal of gamma. Remember that reversal of gamma will be from minus b minus a into c. So, I will leave it as an exercise for you to sit down and really check that left continuity here and the right continuity there are the same. Let us now prove the left continuity of the function L. We will show that given an epsilon positive there exists some delta such that if T prime is in T minus delta to T then L of T minus L of T prime is less than epsilon. That will establish the left continuity. So, let epsilon positive be given. Now, notice that gamma is a function which is continuous on a compact interval a b and in particular it is uniformly continuous as well. So, given epsilon positive since 
L or rather gamma is uniformly continuous on the compact interval AB. There exists some delta prime such that the absolute value of gamma S minus gamma of T is less than epsilon by 2 whenever the distance of T and S is less than delta prime. Now let us use the definition of the arc length of uh, gamma restricted to a comma t and get hold of a partition which is epsilon by 2 close to the arc length. Let p equal to a equal to t0 less than t1 less than all the way up to tn equal to t. Okay, so is it t that we picked? We have picked a t here, so it is just the same t that is being considered here, t n b equal to t such that if you look at the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t, this is what we are interested in approximating. This arc length, this is epsilon by 2 close to gamma of t j minus gamma of t j minus 1 where j is going from 1 to n, now this is less than epsilon by 2. Now let delta be less than the minimum of delta prime. Delta prime is obtained by continuing the uniform continuity and T n minus T n minus 1. Let us consider the last part of the partition which we have just picked and look at the distance of T n and T n minus 1. Let us pick delta which is less than that. The claim is that this delta will do. So, let t prime and t prime be in t minus delta to t. Then let us see what happens. By considering the refinement, of uh, the partition we have just picked, a equal to t0 less than t1 less than Tn now is going to be equal to Tn minus till Tn minus 1 there is no change. At Tn however, we will add the point T prime and Tn plus 1 is going to be equal to T. So, suppose we go down to a further refinement. By triangle inequality, we will have gamma restricted to A comma T this minus the absolute value of gamma of Tj minus gamma of Tj minus 1 this is going to be again less than epsilon by 2 because when by triangle inequality we are going only closer to the uh, real arc length uh, that you should sit down and think about. We still have this inequality. Now we will use the previous problem to write gamma of gamma restricted to AT, the arc length of this, this is the same as the arc length of gamma restricted to AT prime and then the arc length of gamma restricted to T prime comma T. And yeah, so uh, this follows, this is equal by the previous expression, uh, previous problem. And further we will split this into 2, j is equal to 1 to Oh, I was a bit careless, this should be n plus 1 now, because we have added a new point in the partition. Now this is going to be from j equal to 1 to n of gamma of tj minus gamma of tj minus 1. Uh, minus, there will be one more term which is gamma of tn plus 1 minus gamma of tn, which is basically gamma of t minus gamma of t prime. So, notice that I have just rewritten the expression above. So, this expression is the same as this expression. There is no change. I just rewritten it and we know that this is less than epsilon by 2. Now, let us regroup it. Then we have the arc length of gamma restricted to a t prime minus the sum of gamma of tj minus gamma of 
tj minus 1 where j is going from 1 to n now plus gamma restricted to tt prime the arc length of that minus absolute value of gamma of t minus gamma of t prime this is less than epsilon by 2. We have done nothing other than regrouping our terms here. No extra uh, thing has been done. Yes. And uh, we will see that now the arc length of gamma restricted to t prime comma t. This minus the absolute value of gamma of t minus gamma of t prime. This is less than epsilon by 2 minus well, let me write this to be equal to c where this is equal to c where c is positive why is that the case because the arc length is the supremum over all such numbers so in particular this number is greater than the uh, sum that is written to the right and hence the difference is going to be positive so we have c is positive and hence this is still less than epsilon by 2. We can rewrite now what the arc length of gamma restricted to t prime comma t will be that is going to be less than epsilon by 2 plus the absolute value of gamma of t minus gamma of t prime. But how was t prime picked? Let us go up and check how t prime was picked. t prime was picked in the interval t minus delta to t. Delta was less than the minimum of delta prime and mod of tn minus tn minus 1. In particular, it is less than delta prime. And by the uniform continuity of gamma, the number gamma of t minus gamma of t prime will be less than epsilon by 2. So, this will be less than epsilon by 2, which is equal to epsilon. Therefore, gamma restricted to t prime comma t, the arc length of this is less than epsilon. Whenever t prime is in the delta neighborhood to the left of t. We are not still completely done, we are still one step away. We should note here that this is exactly equal to the arc length of gamma restricted to a t minus the arc length of gamma restricted to a t prime. This is precisely what we have because this follows by the first problem and this is exactly equal to ie l of t minus l of t prime this less than epsilon that is precisely what we had set out to do. So, we have established that the function l is a continuous function. We have seen how to compute the integral of a function defined on a curve. Let us now do some explicit computations of such an integral. I will not do all the computations. I will show you how to do the computations uh, in the in the setting we have discussed and leave you with a solution at a stage where it can be taken forward by you by using elementary calculus. So, we will consider the following function. Let f be the function defined to be equal to 1 by z square minus 1. What is that? Uh, this is a rational function which is defined away from 1 and minus 1, solomorphic away from 1 and minus 1. Anyway, we just need continuity on a curve. So, what is the curve we are considering? And gamma of gamma from 0 to pi into c be the curve given by gamma of t is equal to 2 times e to the power i t. So, what is the curve gamma here? Gamma is going to be the circle of radius 2 around the origin. Let this be 1, this be i, this be 2i, this is minus 2, okay, this is minus 1, 1, 2, minus i minus 2 i. This is a circle which I hope I draw it properly.
Yeah, this was intended to be a circle, but that's okay. So the green uh, thing that I have drawn is the circle of radius 2 and our goal is to integrate. So, what is the goal? Compute integral of f of z dz over gamma. This is what we are going to do. Now, the good thing is that the curve that we are considering is continuously differentiable. In fact, it is smooth. So, we will use that aspect of the curve uh, to use the change of variables formula. So, let us look at the solution. Let us see what it is. By the change of variables, we will do the computation explicitly. By the change of variables formula. Oh, before we apply the change of variables formula, let us look at what the function is. Since f of z is equal to 1 by z square minus 1 and uh, by writing it in terms of partial fractions, we can write that this is equal to half of 1 by z minus 1 minus half of 1 by z plus 1. So, z plus 1 minus z minus 1 will give you 2z, the 2s will cancel off, this is going 2 rather, 2s will cancel off and we have 1 by z minus 1 into z plus 1 which is z square plus 1. So, this is precisely what we have, uh, the function that we have. And if you look at integral of f of z dz over gamma, this is going to be equal to the integral of half of 1 by z minus 1 over gamma minus the half minus half of the integral of 1 by z plus 1 over gamma. We will compute these two terms explicitly. We will do it by using the change of variables that we just discussed and this is equal to half of gamma. What is the change of variables? Integral of f of z dz over gamma will be a to b f of gamma of t gamma prime t dt. So, that is going to be half of 0 to 2 pi that is where our curve gamma is defined gamma prime t. So, gamma let me recall gamma of t that is going to be 2 e to the power i t. Gamma prime t is going to be equal to 2 i e to the power i t dt by 2 e to the power i t minus 1 plus or rather minus half of 2 i e to the power i t dt by 2 e to the power i t plus 1. So, this is precisely what we will have to compute. I will just show you how the first term can be computed and leave the second term to you that is going that is going to be quite similar. Even the first term I will just show you what we are exactly dealing with. Consider half integral 0 to 2 pi 2 i e to the power i t dt by 2 e to the power i t minus 1. We will multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator and we will have so the 2s will cancel off i will come out and that will be integral i i times the integral 0 to 2 pi of e to the power i t to e to the power minus i t minus 1 by the absolute value of 2 e to the power i t minus 1 square dt. Let us write this. So, this is going to be equal to 2 minus e to the power i t and we will be getting i times 0 to 2 pi 2 minus cos t plus or rather minus i times sin t by this is going to be equal to 2 cos t minus 1 the whole square plus 2 sin t the whole square. And a computation there will tell us that this is equal to phi minus 4 cos t dt. Now, let us group the 
terms this is equal to integral 0 to 2 pi sin t by phi minus 4 cos t dt plus i times integral 0 to 2 pi 2 minus cos t by phi minus 4 cos t dt. Now we are in good shape because we just have to compute two integrals of real valued functions. Now we are in the setup of real analysis where you can sit down and compute these integrals explicitly from your high school calculus practice. You can check that this is going to be 0, there is an explicit antiderivative which you can get hold of. I will leave it to you to compute this complicated uh, integral in the brackets here. Computing the integral here, if I have not made any mistake earlier, it should turn out to be equal to pi times i. And therefore, we will get that this term is equal to pi times i, this entire term inside the bracket. A very, very similar computation, if you sit and do, you will see that this also turn out to be equal to pi times i and we will end up with, so let me just note that down, by a similar computation, so this term can be computed by that Weierstrass substitution by looking at x is equal to uh, tan of t by 2. I guess. Yeah, anyway, I'll leave that to you. By a similar computation, we also have half of integral of 1 by z plus 1 dz over gamma is also equal to pi times i. And therefore, integral of 1 by z square minus 1 dz over gamma will be equal to pi times i minus pi times i, which is equal to 0. We will see later that uh, this can be computed more easily by developing some more theory in the next few weeks. We will come to that. Right now we have explicitly computed the integral of uh, 1 by z square minus 1 over this curve gamma. Uh, it will be a good exercise for you to do, sit and work out a variant by changing our curve gamma. Let gamma be the curve given by 1 plus uh, e to the power i t. Just changing the curve so that uh, this is now a circle centered at 1 and with a radius equal to 1. So, the curve now is going to be something like this. It is a circle centered at 1 of radius 1. Remember that 1 by z square minus 1 had problems at minus 1 and 1, but now minus 1 is outside this circle, it is not in the interior. We will we'll discuss all these things in great detail and let me just tell you that when you compute uh, 1 by z square minus 1 over that curve, we will still be able to write it in this manner. Now what will happen is, uh, at this particular integral, this is going to vanish and this is what will survive and the uh, value will again turn out to be equal to pi times i. That is something which I will leave you, leave it to you uh, to sit down and check. So, this is an exercise within the problem session. So, let me just put it that way. Compute the integral of 1 by z square minus 1 over gamma. The next couple of problems deals with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let me write it down for you. What is this problem? This is problem 4, I guess. Prove that the function f of z equal to 1 by z does not have an antiderivative in c minus 0, omega here is c minus 0.
So this problem will turn out to be a direct application of the first fundamental theorem of calculus. If you recall, the first fundamental theorem of calculus said the following. Suppose f is a function which is continuous and uh, uh, defined in omega and suppose capital F is an antiderivative of small f. That means capital F prime is equal to small f and suppose there is a curve gamma and if we integrate small f over gamma then we have the integral is equal to capital F of z1 minus capital F of z0 where z1 is the terminal point and z0 is the initial point. We will show that the antiderivative uh, if it exists in this problem it does not satisfy the fundamental theorem of calculus and there, thereby we will be able to conclude that it does not have an antiderivative. And in order to do that let us consider a closed curve in C minus 0. Let us give a proof. Let, uh, let us consider the circle of the unit circle, the circle of radius 1 around 0. Consider gamma of t to be equal to e to the power i t gamma on 0 to 2 pi. So, this is going to be the unit circle of radius 1. Its starting point is the, the complex number 1 and its end point is also the complex number 1. If our function f had an antiderivative, if f of z had an antiderivative in c minus 0, notice that our unit circle does not pass through the origin and therefore it is a curve in c minus 0. So, if f of z had an antiderivative in c minus 0, then say capital F, then integral of f of z dz over gamma that is just going to be equal to f of the end point which is 1 minus the minus f of the initial point which is also 1 and that will turn out to be equal to 0. So, basically the uh, integral of such functions over closed curves is going to be 0. But let us now do one thing, let us sit and compute explicitly what the integral of f of z over gamma is. Let us compute integral f of z dz over gamma and in order to do that we will use the change of variable. Gamma is a very nice curve, it is not some arbitrary rectifiable curve, it, indeed in, it is a rectifiable curve but it is much more, it is actually a smooth function, it is continuously differentiable with no singularities. So, gamma of t, so what we are doing can be done for continuously differentiable functions. It is e to the power i t and by using the change of variables, integral of 1 by z dz over gamma, this is going to be equal to i e to the power i t dt, that is what gamma prime t dt is, by e to the power i t, that is f of gamma of t and the integral is from 0 to 2 pi and what we end up is i times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of dt which is equal to 2 pi i which is certainly not equal to 0. Therefore, the function f of z equal to 1 by z does not have an antiderivative. We will come back to this question of uh, when we can talk about the existence of an antiderivative of 1 by z later, but on c minus 0 we have just established that we do not have an antiderivative. So, there are domains where we cannot talk about the antiderivative of f. Let us conclude this problem session by proving the integration by parts for holomorphic functions. Let me write down the problem and let us prove it. Let f, uh, let omega contained in C be an open subset of the complex plane and f and g be two functions which are holomorphic on omega, omega to C be holomorphic. Let gamma from 
uh, a b into omega be some rectifiable curve be a rectifiable curve then integral f of z g prime of z dz over gamma this is equal to f of z1 g of z1 minus f of z0 g of z0 minus the integral over gamma f prime of z g of z dz where z0 and z1 respectively respectively are the initial and the terminal points of gamma where z0 uh, and z1 are respectively the initial and terminal points of gamma the expression written here is what's popularly called as the integration by parts the proof is actually quite straightforward it's a direct consequence of the fundamental theorem of calculus suppose we look at the derivative of uh, f and g so let capital f of z be given by f of z g of z derivative of this so d by dz of this rather let me just put a prime here to denote that we are looking at the derivative of f of z times g of z then what is the fundamental theorem of calculus telling us by the fundamental theorem of calculus integral of f of z dz over gamma that is going to be equal to f of z1 g of z1 minus f of z0 g of z0 but we also know what f is we know that f of z is f of z times g of z prime by the product rule the product rule tells us that capital f of z is equal to f prime of z times g of z plus f of z times g prime of z where f prime and g prime respectively are the derivatives of f and g remember that we have started off with holomorphic functions f and g so all this makes sense and by the properties of the integral we have discussed earlier integral f over gamma integral of f of z dz over gamma this is equal to the integral of f prime of z g of z dz plus the integral over gamma of f of z g prime of z dz and that is precisely what we had set out to prove that both these numbers are equal and with that we get a very straightforward proof of the integration by parts. So let, let me stop here.